Okay, I want to welcome everybody to tonight's Fireside Chat with Lyndon LaRouche for Thursday, January 12th. Uh, we have two speakers tonight, and we're going to get right to them. But what we want to do is to begin by pointing out that uh, we will have conducted three separate public awareness interventions of an international character this week. I think that's probably a first for our organization, at least recently, meaning over the last decade or so. Uh, Sunday, Diane Sayre did something as an independent candidate. There was a policy forum. Tuesday, Helga Sepp LaRouche did a policy forum focused in Germany, but also of an international character. And then this coming Saturday, uh, the Schiller Institute will be carrying out uh, a symposium. And uh, what we're going to do tonight is uh, just open with uh, a bit from a kind of, it's not really a, uh, uh, it's not really a new invitation for that event. It's sort of an update, uh, and it is entitled, Did You Vote for the Present War with Russia and the Next War with China? Who authorized NATO and the European Union to organize World War III? And then it simply indicates the event of this week, uh, Saturday, resurrect the true mission of Dr. Martin Luther King, stop NATO's world war, and dismantle the International Assassination Bureau. It gives the date of Saturday, January 14th, and the time is 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. It says, whatever you may have been told, Russia, perhaps now the world's leading thermonuclear weapons power, believes that it is fighting the United States, Great Britain, and NATO in a proxy war, one that only foolish, uninformed people in, quote, the West, referred to as, quote, the war between Ukraine and Russia. Considering that the United States has in one year directly deployed and acknowledged $112 billion worth of weapons and material into Ukraine, an amount far larger than the entire military, uh, annual military budget of Russia, and that all other European military, logistical, and financial aid has been in addition to that, that belief seems more than justified. Russian Security Council Secretary Nikolai Petrushev gave a far-ranging interview with weekly newspaper Argumenti Ifakti on January 10th, in which he charged that the American state is only, quote, a cover for a conglomerate of huge corporations that rule the country and try to dominate the world. U.S. authorities, allied to big interests, so forth and so on, goes to some other things here. I'm not going to read it all. I just want to try to give you sense, guys a sense of what we're saying here. Without a condition of trust between adversaries perceived or real in a world dominated by ultimate warfare, a cliff to, to whose edge we are inching ever closer, a mere lapse of judgment could be enough to hurdle humanity over the abyss. We will, we will not return from that mistake or act of hubris. The chance that thermonuclear war could be launched by miscalculation or by the madness or folly of an individual, nation, or even, quote, conglomerate, means that extraordinary leadership of the highest caliber, trusted and trustworthy leadership, must be available uh, to deliberate among adversarial nations. Petrushev further described a population reduction agenda on the part of what he termed, quote, the business elite. Amid the fundamental changes in the world, the corporations have one goal, to preserve the system of global exploitation. It is headed by an elite of businessmen that do not tie themselves to any state. Beneath it are the so-called developing countries and the golden billion. And further below is the rest of humanity, contemptuously referred to as, quote, the third world, end quote. Certainly population reduction including the dramatic reduction of the potential population density of whole regions of the planet, has been the result of the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, and various theaters of war in Africa over the past 30 years. Certainly, the late Prince Philip, as well as other members of British royal family-affiliated institutions, have stated in documents published by several think tanks over the decades that it were desirable that the Earth's population be no more than 1 to 2 billion people, a policy that would, by the way, lead to thermonuclear war well before its completion. States and people need to negotiate their futures and destiny 
And to do that, they need to listen to the words of international leaders and references, such as the Pope, intellectual and local actors, civil society, diplomats, and all peace actors one person has recommended. This week, Helica Zepp-Lagrouche, founder and head of the International Schiller Institute, is appearing in three different symposia as part of a public awareness uh, campaign and discussion designed to propose a solution to otherwise inevitable ultimate war and for the establishment of a higher global peace and development architecture that allows for not only durable human survival, but durable prosperity as well. And then it goes on from there. But that's the basic idea. And I wanted to simply give that idea so that when we open up now and we have the discussion we have, people are clear what our deployment is. We have a, an event in less than 48 hours. And that event itself is, the, is a nodal point on the way to a conference, Schiller Institute conference, that will be held three weeks from this coming Saturday, for which we haven't decided exact objectives, but we do know that we intend to make it the largest and most active conference we've ever done uh, given the fact that the circumstance that we now confront is the most dangerous that the planet has ever been in. So I requested that tonight we would begin with a presentation given by Renee Segerson. Now, Renee wrote an article, which some of you would have read in the Executive Intelligence Review, which dealt with, well, we could call it the figure, call, let's call it more the blob called Mike, Mike Pompeo. I'm not referring to his girth or vanishing girth. I'm referring to his moral character, uh, sort of like the famous 1957 uh, movie about the blob, if you remember what it was, a kind of a jellified horror uh, that tried to sort of suck up the world. Uh, and the problem, this is a character that believes that he has the uh, uh, right to run for president of the United States. John Bolton is another such creature that's appeared and, and the, the, the purpose of our organization's uh, uh, review, not of the character of Mike Pompeo, but the blob that he represents, uh, is to indicate the kind of feature of, human, of American life that has to be eliminated in order for thermonuclear war to be, uh, to be avoided. When we say eliminate, we're not talking about some physical attack on these characters because they are not really flesh and blood. They represent, as it's been said before, principalities and powers forces of darkness and wickedness in high places. So eliminating them physically would do no good. What we have to do is eliminate their moral hold on the minds of the people of the United States and the world. And in order to do that, one has to dig deeply into, if you will, their epistemological nature. In other words, what actually makes them possible in the realm of the culture upon which they seek to feed. And so the idea is to try to give you at least some end of, a way of thinking about the methods of investigation that will allow us to actually determine these sorts of things and how it is these forces can be defeated. So, uh, Renee, you now have the floor. Please go ahead. Well, thanks, Dennis. I have to say, when I think of you and me being on the same phone line, it would be preferential to me if we were talking about Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata and what a perfect piece it is for and introducing all sorts of people who are complaining that they can't figure out that they don't know enough about classical music to appreciate all the things we're saying about that in this period. Um, and I recall, uh, well, I've learned in the recent period that the Appassionata is a perfect uh, composition for opening the doors for people who are well-meaning and have a good heart uh, to begin to understand this. However, I'm not complaining that that's not what we're talking about. I'm just referencing this because in order to look at somebody like, uh, it, to look at a phenomenon, which is what we're looking at, we're not just looking at a person, we're looking at a phenomenon, you have to be able to put yourself on the top of the process and not lose your sense of humor because it's really an ugly picture and the ugliness does tend to work away at one's determination. But I have some, I have some help tonight um, in, in getting this across. I've also asked Carl Osgood to um, speak when I'm finished because uh, 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 Michael Pompeo has been building his campaign for the presidency. He now has about $8 million in his campaign account. He 
He's been building it, as Stan Ezrol has very helpfully documented, by these trips that he has taken to, um, uh, to Taiwan uh, and the interaction that he's created with the anti-Chinese, anti-mainland Chinese political movement in Taiwan, which he is stoking. I guess he, he, he's on this, you know, he's acting like the, he's, he's picking up where, where uh, Nancy Pelosi left off. Uh, and he's made two trips there, which were fundraising trips for his own personal, um, for his own personal accounts. And the uh, businesses associated with the independence movement in Taiwan uh, actually, uh, turned, actually poured out a fair amount of money to, uh, for him. Um, and uh, uh, what he's doing there, as Carl made clear, is pushing us closer towards the two-front thermonuclear war that many people in the NATO command consider inevitable. We'll come back to this. Carl will go through this at the end, what, what the stakes are. But I want to say that our work in going through the Pompeo case, who much like Barack Obama, if you remember when he was elected, Pompeo was a person who, when he was made head of the CIA, overwhelmingly most people in the United States had absolutely not the faintest idea who he was. Uh, he was one of these laundered personalities, one of these shaped personalities created by the intelligence community, actually molded by the intelligence community before he was, was head of the CIA in the same way that, that Obama was. And if you remember, when Obama was elected, nobody knew where he was born, nobody knew who his father was, nobody knew where he went to college. Most of these questions have never been answered. Well, the other person about whom nothing was known, although he became the center of a lot of attention at a certain point, was, um, was Pompeo until some journalists sort of freaked out and started digging deep and finding out things that really should have been out there in the, in, right, right there from the beginning. You know, for example, people were told that he, that he was a, um, a Kansas redneck who was benefiting from the Tea Party Rebellion around two, uh, 2010, that that's why he got elected. Well, that, that's a fictional story. I mean, not only were all of four of his elections paid for by the Koch brothers, which they did, they did dole, it out for, dole, it out, dole out money for some of these um, uh, Tea Party type activities. Um, uh, the reality of the situation was that he was not born in Kansas. He was born in California, and he was already a sculpted uh, intelligence operative of some significance, probably probably sifted into the political system to carry out exactly the kind of operation that he ended up carrying out, uh, which was the destruction of the Trump administration from the inside. He was actually deployed to destroy the confidence and the ability of Trump to function. And uh, while right now uh, uh, he is, um, uh, he says he is running for president, as uh, excuse me, I shouldn't say that. He is setting up a committee, which everybody knows is intended to be his presidential fund. His um, uh, mirror image, in a certain sense, is his, his, uh, his, his fellow tag team member, uh, John Bolton, was more aggressive and told a British newspaper that he is running for president. He announced this in London, not in the United States. He announced it to a London corridor. Now, um, this is not the first time that these two guys have had this kind of tag team relationship, which will become clearer when I go through some of the details. Uh, Pompeo became, even though people didn't know much about him, he became somewhat notorious because of the statement that he made in 2019 in front of an auditorium filled with college students over there at Texas A&M University who were howling and cheering and laughing um, as he answered the question, what did it feel like to, be a member, to become a member of the cabinet um, of the U.S. government? And his answer has, been, um, has become quite famous around the world. Just the other day, uh, one of the French generals who was speaking at our event quoted this kind of in amazement. He said, um, 
this is Pompeo speaking, it's a tough world out there in terms of how you think about problem sets. When I was a cadet, what the cadet's motto was at West Point, you will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. I was the CIA director. We lied. We cheated. We stealed. He actually said steal, and then he corrected himself and said stole. We had entire training courses. It reminds you of the glory of the American experiment. And as he was saying this, yes, I am a liar. I am somebody who cheats and steals. They were laughing hysterically and, and, and applauding wildly in the audience. Kind of a sad commentary. He said the same thing recently when he was speaking in Connecticut, and we intervened on his event there and confronted him that his policies have been root to the danger of thermonuclear war, which is now confronting mankind. Uh, and uh, many, the, majority, the overwhelmingly, the audience was very upset with what we were doing. And overwhelmingly, even though on the surface, they looked like intelligent people. <laughs> when as the, the second that he goofed around and claimed that he was willing to discuss these things in an orderly way as our people were being thrown out of the room, um, he didn't say, you know, don't throw them out. I want to talk to them. He, they were being thrown out. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to you about these things. Uh, they were, you know, um, uh, cheering him on and laughing along with him, which is really pathetic. Now, we're gonna, we have a lot on who he really is. We've watched this for years and how he operates and so forth. And the importance of this thing, I just want to cite three three ways in which this is very important. One, we do want to yank out from under them, from, from under him and Bolton, the rug from their insane uh, presidential, so-called presidential campaigns. We want to get rid of both of them. Number two, that you now are hearing about uh, the new members of Congress, a handful of, of the Republicans in Congress around the Freedom Caucus, Freedom, uh, yeah, for, uh, the Freedom Caucus, um, calling for a new church committee to be created, like the one in the 1960s, to examine intelligence community interference in the electoral process, that this is what they want to look into. And there are many aspects of the, uh, the method by which you have to look at, at uh, Pompeo, but also the details of what he was involved in, because he was the person who sabotaged the proper investigation of the Russia Gate accusations. Remember Russiagate, you know, Ronald, Donald Trump was elected because the Russians wanted him to be, and they interfered in the electoral process. What a bunch of hooey, what a bunch of nonsense, which has never, ever, ever been documented. There is no, there is no evidentiary proof of this, um, and yet it still gets repeated. Um, and it was, it was Pompeo who refused to uh, to go to people in Congress and other branches of the CIA when he was CIA director with William Binney's airtight, hardcore documentation that the Russians did not hack the DNC computers, but that that information could only have been liberated from, from the DNC computers uh, by somebody who was standing in the office of the De Democratic National Committee. People may remember that. And Binney met with him, gave him all the documentation, and he just shrugged his shoulders and irresponsibly, cheating and, 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 and lying, uh, said, well, I just believe um, what, the, what the intelligence community is saying. You know, it's sort of like what, what, Chuck, what Chuck Schumer said when he said, Donald Trump is crazy for challenging the intelligence community. They can get you six ways from Sundays for, for doing that. Um, these are people who, for whom it is sacrosanct. It is above your commitment to, to God that you do not interfere with the activities of the intelligence community. So in, I used to think that, um, uh, that, that uh, uh, Pompeo was brought into this process kind of gradually over time, largely through the financial support of the, um, of the, Koch, of the Koch industries apparatus of the Koch brothers which at that time was Charles and David Koch. David is dead. Charles is getting very old. Koch is sort of going through a, a, a makeup re, uh, um, 
remake right now, uh, cosmetic remake right now in terms of how they operate. Uh, but back then in the 1990s, when um, when Pompeo came out of uh, came out of his military service following his period at uh, uh, West Point, uh, he was basically he he basically was adopt. It looked like he was adopted by the uh, um, by the by Coke Industries because when he arrived in Kansas. There was waiting for him at a local bank, $90 million credit line for him to set up a co- an aerospace supplies company, which he named FAIR. Okay, now, uh, um, and that's what I thought was really the pathway through which he was recruited into this insidious role of being a, uh, an infiltrator into the, into the political system in the United States. Um, I'm thinking about it differently now after reviewing what we've pulled together uh, on this Asian s- situation, but also uh, reflecting on what I actually, which, what, I, what I knew back then, but which I couldn't see. Because a lot of what the, the way these guys operate in politics is through perception games. And sometimes you have to really concentrate. It's sort of a horrible experience, but you have to really concentrate to figure out what is going on behind the perception game. And one of the most uh, uh, unexplained aspects of Pompeo's career is what happened to him when he w- immediately after leaving, graduating from West Point, where apparently he was one of the top students, if not number one in the entire school, which is kind of wild. He's really not that smart, but kind of a weird place um, in many respects. So it's, it's not surprising that somebody like him would, would, would rise to the top. But he was, um, uh, when, when he was finished with, with West Point, as everybody was, is expected there to do, he had to do military service for a few years. And uh, when he ran for Congress in 2010, a rumor was put out that like his bosom buddy, Mark Esper, you remember that name, Mark Esper? He was, he was defense secretary under Trump. That's how long these guys stuck together. Mark Esper was part of the small private fraternity, so to speak, that that he and uh, uh, that uh, Pompeo had around him. He had a group around. It wasn't I don't think it was a formal fraternity, but it was these five guys who were always together, always in touch with each other, remained in touch with each other after uh, after uh, their West Point experience. And continued to work together, so that you know uh, some of the people that that Pompeo brought into the into the CIA that he had with him in business back in the 1990s were the same guys with whom he had this special relationship when he was at when he was at West Point. But when West Point was finished, Esper did Esper um, uh, uh, was was drafted to go, to participate in Desert Storm, and this rumor started that Pompeo also served in Desert Storm right after he got out of, um, that he got out of, of uh, West Point. Well, that never happened. That only came out 10 years later after he had been reelected four times with money from the, from, from the Koch brothers. It, was, it only came out because some, some um, determined investigative reporters decided to really ch- look into this and to find the documentation that he had been in Desert Storm. He never was in Desert Storm, and he never corrected this. And there were people in Congress who used to repeat this, when, even when he was in the CIA, from your experience in Desert Storm. You know, they would talk to him that way. And, and he would never correct them. Um, so what was he covering up for? He did admit that one of his deployments, but it seems like it was the only one, was, quote, unquote, the way he described it was, fixing tanks that were stationed on the border between East and West Germany. Now, what year are we talking about? We're talking about 1986. He leaves West Point. They all graduate from West Point in 1986. And then he's deployed to Germany. And where is he deployed? On the border between East and West Germany, just as the situation is nearing towards complete explosion where the East German system came down, the whole Soviet system came down, and he's there on the border. Now, if you know anything about what goes on, what's been going on in Germany for decades, 
There is no Western country in the world where there are more intelligence agencies wandering around picking people up. Henry Kissinger was picked up in, 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 in Germany at the, at the close of World War II. It is one of the most uh, um, infested areas of the world for intelligence operations, including the profiling of individuals for the purpose of, um, of using them in subsequent situations. I actually have personal experience with this because when the first year I was in the Labor Committee, I was a student in Germany. I was there with my future husband. And, um, uh, uh, and we were working with people to build the, uh, to make Linden's work famous and well known among, among students in, in, in Germany. And it was only when we came back to the United States that we realized that, that some of the people that we had been interacting with were actually uh, East German agents who had been sent in and who were turned against our organization later on. In fact, John was even denounced in a, in a book that they put out um, uh, and, and, and so forth. So we had personal experience with this. It, it, it was just pervasive throughout the social environment. So if you have a guy who's spending a few years, even a couple of years, or at least a couple of years, we don't know the rest of it, and he's there, you know, quote unquote, fixing tanks on the border between the two countries, and the border's about to come down, and the entire situation is changing. You can just imagine who would have, knowing him now, who would have picked him up and trained him. It didn't have to be the CIA. It could have been NATO intelligence. There's a lot of different branches of this. They're not all the same. They don't all operate exactly the same way. Certainly in Germany, the NATO apparatus was more pervasive. Um, and, uh, and, you know, training people um, that they will lie, cheat, and steal in order to serve the, the objectives of these intelligence outfits. So he arrives in Kansas, and as far as I'm concerned, he wasn't adopted. He was assigned by agreement to the Koch brothers, who would be the perfect people to pick up on this, because the Koch brothers themselves are a product of Anglo-Dutch, um, particularly Dutch-related intelligence warfare operations against the United States that go back over 100 years. I mean, the, the grandfather of, of, the, of that family was a, was a Dutch investor who was a supporter of Adolf Hitler. His son ran um, uh, profiles of the uh, oil industry in um, in Soviet Russia during the 1930s, he became, he got thrown out by Stalin. He was, he was, he was picked up by, um, uh, uh, he was picked up by the FBI afterwards. And that's the roots of this company, which today, by the way, I find, if there are people on the phone listening who are in the farm states, you know, like in the Dakotas, and I say Coke brothers, you know, Coke industries, you all know who it is because they have such a dominant position in the um, uh, fertilizer industry and other commodities. The people on the East Coast and the West Coast tend to have much, a much less clear idea about who they might be. Um, uh, the the you know, reality of the situation is that Coke Industries is the second largest privately held corporation. Its stocks are not available on the stock market. They're privately held. All of its business dealings are completely confidential. The government has absolutely no idea how they do what they do. They have, you know, they, are, they, they have been sued about on um, taxes and so forth because of this more than once. Um, but the, uh, uh, um, but they are now, their annual revenues are $100 billion a year. They're number two in the United States. I forget who number one is. And um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, this kind of capacity was created over an extended period of time uh, in which there's, a, there's an excellent book that has came out in the, um, uh, a couple of years ago uh, about their background that was done by some investigative journalist um, uh, on the history of the, of the Koch brothers. And I have to say that, it, which really got to the root of this, and these guys um, uh, documented that the two periods in which this quasi-criminal operation was able to lurch into having such a massive uh, financial clout were number one, 
1971, when Nixon ended the Bretton Woods system, and then in 1999, when Glass-Steagall was repealed. And at those two junctures, the company took a huge leap in its command over financial revenues, speculative revenues, and the ability to influence the situation. And that's the context in which they, they picked up, they picked up um, uh, Pompeo, but also um, had, had a senator under their control in the, in the Congress who was running around calling, I kid you not, they had a, they had a senator who was an accountant from Kansas who didn't know, who didn't know anything about the rest of the world. And this guy was running around in Congress in the 1990s. His name was Brownback. Maybe a few of you have heard of him. He was running around in the Congress during the 1990s calling for NATO to occupy all of the former Soviet uh, countries, uh, former, former, um, the, the, central, the, this, the uh, central Asian countries that had formerly been part of the Soviet Union. In other words, that NATO should, take, should occupy Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. That's what the guy was talking about in the Congress. He didn't last very long in the Congress, in the Senate, but he was there, and he and Pompeo used to run around, even when Pompeo, together, uh, when Pompeo was Secretary of State, digging up terrorist organizations to introduce to Donald Trump. So talk about weird people doing weird things. This, is, this was typical, the kind of politics that they were financing. So um, uh, when we get to the period that, um, uh, ha, you know, how did, how did this guy who was a four-term uh, shadow, shadowy uh, congressman who, people, who, had been, who did not support Trump in any of the pres, in his presidential race, he supported um, a Ted Cruz. How did he get appointed to be a CIA director? The um, uh, generally assumed that he got that that Trump was convinced to appoint him, even though Pompeo had denounced Trump very heartily uh, during the in 2016 during the election campaign. Um, uh, he was recommended by a fellow by the name of David Urban. If people have followed politics, they may have, the name might be somewhat familiar. He is reputed to be the person who won the Pennsylvania uh, uh, election for Trump in 2016. He is one of the cronies of the group of five that go all the way back to this West Point relationship. It's also important to know about, about um, Pompeo. It should not be ignored that um, he... He, he claims, he doesn't talk about religion a lot, but he claims that he is an advocate of some kind of end times, uh, quote unquote, Christian denomination. And that he does Sunday school teaching for this, that he is, that he is a believer in this end times ideology. Something that he either picked up at, at uh, West Point or soon thereafter, or when he was in the military afterwards. It's, un- it's unclear. Um, and uh, that is very significant because, uh, and, and, and Brownback is, is, is an overt end times advocate. You know, these are people who think it's inevitable that God is determined to wipe out the human species, and it's only the people who think like I do who are the ones who are going to survive anyway. So therefore, they have a very different attitude towards the danger of nuclear war. Um, he doesn't talk about it a lot, as far as I can see. He doesn't, he, he doesn't go around, you know, boasting about it. But um, it's generally believed and assumed that that is where he comes from. And just to round this up so I don't take all the time, because you can see the way, as you're looking at this, you know, there's a lot of micro details, which I'm trying to present sort of as a thread so that it's a little bit more, it's a little bit easier to follow in this kind of um, uh, medium people can read my article a lot of a lot of this is in the article from um that was published august 28 2020 in the eir and people can just download that and and t- and take a look at it um but you can see that the that the issue is involved in being able to assemble like a gestalt of somebody of how their mind works and why they act the way they do you know why is why is pompeo running around in 
in, in, in Taiwan raising money for his presidential campaign, uh, saying things, which I'll read in a minute, that in order to do this, you have to, you have to keep your mind on a higher level where you're really looking for the underlying pattern. The underlying pattern is not about Pompeo. The underlying pattern is about these intelligence agencies that operate in order to mold people like this and to recruit people like this. And this is something that we really have to deal with, that we have to really face, that the intelligence agencies are hugely involved. In, in many, and you know, uh, many of the people who are now serving in Congress have intelligence backgrounds. Where you have this strange case of somebody like Adam Schiff. I mean, I've always, you know, I, I wonder, I think we really need to say more about him, you know, who for many years was an attorney for the FBI and became notorious for a case that he ran that involved relations with the Soviet Union, a case that he lost, by the way. It, it was a poor guy in the FBI who was, who, who was who being denied his pension because he was, he was called a spy. And he said, I was not a spy. I was just following orders and doing what I was told to do. And the guy won the case, and Schiff lost the case. But his name was in the media enough that he was able to get elected to Congress, and he's been in Congress ever since. It's happened decades ago. How does a guy like that end up in Congress? Why do we have these intelligence operatives in the Congress? Certainly the Cheney family is an example of that as well. It's because we don't really look at the way people think and make them accountable to it because everybody's so overwhelmed by the... Um, uh, the, the magnitude of the problem. So here you have this guy um, running over to Taiwan uh, in the recent period. And again, thanks to Stan Ezrell for making this available, um, uh, where he said um, in March of 2000, he was, there, he was in, in Taiwan two times during 2022. And, and uh, Carl will make clear of why this is really ominous and, and bad news. And in uh, uh, a, an Asian newspapers reported that on one of those occasions, he said, the United States government should immediately take necessary and long overdue steps to do the right and obvious thing. That is to offer the Republic of China, Taiwan, America's diplomatic reg recognition as a free and sovereign country. In other words, screw China, you are no longer part of China. And uh, he, he, he was there first in March, then he came back in June. Uh, he, 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 excuse me, he was there in March, and then in June, he delivered a blood-curdling speech at the Hudson Institute, which was not so much on Asia. It was how, how wonderful this war is in, in, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, which he admitted is, Ukraine dying to fight America's war. He admitted that, but he said this was an absolutely wonderful thing. This is where the end times mentality comes in. He said, we know in America, the gift of freedom is always purchased. Get a load of that one. The gift of freedom is purchased. See the mindset that you're dealing with? This fact is iridescent today in Ukraine. Men and women of extraordinary intrepidity are sacrificing themselves to secure liberty for their and for their, their children and their countrymen. Vladimir Putin's utter lack of basic humanity ensures that as long as he remains in power, Russia will be a virtual prison and no nation that borders its expanse will ever be safe. Liberty, as promised in our Declaration of Independence and as guaranteed by our Constitution, and guaranteed by the Constitution of Ukraine, this is, I'm reading from his speech, is thus only possible if limited government is, is practiced and not enlarged for expansive power through its desire to accrete power, utterly destroying liberty. His libertarian uh, proclivities that you really don't need government. You really keep the government as small and weak as possible so that people like me can you know, push them around and so forth. Um, so you get the idea. He was there praising the fact that all of these Ukrainians are willing to die for the cause of defending the United States from this phantom of Russia. Get a load of that, um, you know, but also Russia wanting to, to expand its borders and create it. He says at some point that Russia wants to create a new, a new um, 
Soviet empire. Real, real sick mind. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is my own personal assessment is that he played a huge role in, um, uh, in destroying the Trump administration from within. After he was in the CIA and was brought over to the State Department, that's exactly when Bolton, this is where the tag team element comes in, that's exactly when Bolton was made the head of the National Security Agency. <clears throat> Bolton, as we all remember, was this total few, fool who was running around overtly wrecking anything good that Trump was doing, like the, like the you know, the very interesting dialogue that he had started with Kim Jong-un in, in uh, North Korea about economic development of North Korea. And he wrecked the whole thing. He said, well, you know, I'm, we're willing to go to a nuclear war against you, at which point the guy completely freaked out in a summit meeting that Trump was supposed to have in Vietnam never occurred. So here you had Bolton running around doing a wrecking operation. And in contrast to that, for about a year, what Pompeo was actually doing was um, stroking Trump and telling him how brilliant he was and how much he approved and supported his, his uh, excellent relationship uh, with Xi Jinping in China and, and what, it, what an important uh, step that was. It was only after Trump fired Bolton, removed this crazy woman, uh, Chiron uh, Skinner, from the Hudson, uh, from the, excuse me, the Hoover Institute. Oh, my God, the Hoover Institute. This, that place should be, should be shut down. Uh, where she was, um, uh, you know, she was sent over to the State Department from the Hoover Institute, and they were running these seminars. Even though, even though Pompeo was Secretary of State, he was telling Trump everything he was doing was brilliant. And every Saturday, she ran a seminar with this, uh, dis dif this dissident from China by the name of Michael Yu, who was brainwashing everybody in the State Department about how horrible Xi Jinping was and how horrible the government was. And, and, and uh, Pompeo was allowing this to happen. Bolton gets thrown out. You probably remember Trump saying, <coughs> Bolton, want, you know, Bolton wants to start World War VI. And he threw him out. She was asked to leave. But Pompeo now had, this, had the, 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 the area clear for himself. And he and Esper uh, molded these incredible maneuvers where they eventually got Trump to um, assassinate, the, um, uh, assassinate the top guy in Iran, um, Soleimani, which was a complete disaster for Trump's credibility and his state of mind and his foreign policy, and then when the pandemic hit, he just, he just wasn't capable of seizing the, he just was out of it, frankly, in terms of the level of leadership that was needed, and he didn't really have anybody around him to help. The only person who wanted to help him was actually Andrew Cuomo, and you know what happened to him. And, and by the way, Pompeo was involved in the process that led to Andrew Cuomo being thrown out as governor of New York. I don't have to go through the details of that. That's how thorough his insidious behavior was. He went, after, he went after the governors, said you're not allowed to, this is Pompeo, you're not allowed to meet with China. China deliberately spread the pandemic. This did not come from Trump. It came from Pompeo. And he did it first at a governor's convention. And he said, I've got the FBI watching you guys to see what your connection is to um, uh, ch the Chinese consulates. And he did the same thing in Wisconsin right before the election. Wisconsin was a key state that Trump had won in the, in the 2016 election. And Pompeo was on the scene creating total demoralization there. So I've, I, hope, um, I, I, I hope I haven't overwhelmed you with micro details. That's the problem you run into when you do this kind of thing. You've got to think in terms of the unifying one. But if it's, the people can always ask questions afterwards. And I'd like to hand it over to Carl, who can now make clearer why th these details are now so important in terms of in terms of what we've got to what we have to deal with in this japan situation and what's happening in asia okay carl you there yeah i'm here okay go right ahead all right well i, I guess after what all that renee just went through i guess i should say first of all that it would be a mistake to think that that mike pompeo actually gives a damn about the people of taiwan uh, because the, the role that Taiwan is going to play, is intended to play, is the same as Ukraine against Russia. 
Taiwan is basically a uh, pressure point against China, a military pressure point against China, uh, exactly the same way that Ukraine is the military pressure point against against uh, Russia. You, you know, the Russians have said repeatedly that they're not fighting Ukraine in Ukraine, they're fighting NATO in Ukraine. And the same will be true of China uh, if there's a clash over Taiwan or any other issue in the East or South China Seas. They will not be fighting Taiwan. They will be fighting the U.S., Japan, Australia, uh, maybe uh, NATO, because NATO is, you know, there's actually a tenuous so far connection between Taiwan and NATO because uh, at least one Taiwan Air Force officer has attended a, a NATO school in Rome. So there is a connection there already. And, of course, the uh, uh, NATO has been seeking relationships with Japan, Australia, and South Korea for some time. That's, not, that's been going on for a while and now is being strengthened, shall we say. Uh, uh, there was just recently, this is on January 10th, the uh, U.S. Uh, US a three-star general uh, made this very clear how this is going to work. Uh, he made this clear how this is going to work in an interview with the Financial Times. Uh, his name is Lieutenant General James Bierman. He's the commanding general of the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force and Marine Forces Japan. Uh, who basically said in the interview with the Financial Times that U.S. NATO support uh, for the Kiev regime is the model for how the U.S. military in Asia is working with allies to contain China. He said, the U.S. and Japanese militaries have seen, have, have seen exponential increases just over the last year in their operations on the territory that they would have to defend in case of a war. He said, why have we achieved the level of success we have achieved in Ukraine? A big part of that has been because after Russian aggression in 2014 and 2015, it, that's, that's how the U.S. military views it, as Russian aggression, we earnestly got after preparing for a future conflict, training for the Ukrainians, prepositioning of supplies, identification of sites from which we could operate, support, sustain operations. We call that setting the, the theater, and we are setting the theater in Japan, in the Philippines, and in other locations. So... So this is exactly what's going on. There's uh, Marine Corps forces are being reorganized in Okinawa and in Guam uh, to have uh, actually to have anti uh, ship and other advanced capabilities to be able to, to supposedly be able to be able to be dispersed to islands across the Western Pacific and be able to sink J uh, Chinese Navy ships. So that's already going on. Uh, just yesterday. Uh, the uh, foreign minister and defense minister of Japan were in Washington. They had meetings with their Biden administration counterparts. They put out a, a, uh, a statement which made, makes clear that, that this is uh, that, the, 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 that the nuclear dimension is very much a part of this relationship, this uh, U.S.-Japan alliance aimed at China. They issued a joint statement in which they said, the United States restated its unwavering commitment to the defense of Japan under Article 5 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty using its full range of capabilities, including nuclear. The ministers held an in-depth discussion on U.S. extended deterrence for Japan, as well as on the recently released U.S. Nuclear Posture Review, and reaffirmed the critical importance of ensuring U.S. extended deterrence remains credible, resilient, and resilient, bolstered by Japan's capabilities. Uh, they, I mean, they made that. They also made the point in the joint statement that this extends to, they say, the foreign ministers reiterated their strong opposition to China's intensified efforts to unilaterally change the status quo by force in the East China Sea, including through actions that seek to undermine Japan's longstanding administration of the Senkaku Island. Uh, the U.S. reaffirmed the Article Five that Article Five of the treaty applies to the Senkaku Islands. Imagine that. We're, we're willing to risk going to nuclear war over these uninhabited islands in the South China Sea, which are actually closer to Taiwan than they are to Japan. Uh, nobody's asked the, nobody has come to the American people and asked them if they're really in favor of risking nuclear war over these islands, which, by the way, China also claims. Uh, and so they went on with the usual uh, rhetoric about China being a threat to the rules-based international order and, and so forth. Uh, 
So what all of this comes out of, there was just in December. So actually, oh, before I go on beyond that, what was happening at the same time that the ministers were in Washington was that the Japanese Prime Minister Kishida was in London, where he signed what is with uh, Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister, they signed a defense agreement called a Reciprocal Access Agreement that allows both countries to deploy forces on each other's soil. So this is like an upgrading of the military relationship between Japan and Britain. So the British could deploy British troops to Japan. That's all of the legal aspects of that are already covered and vice versa, that Japanese troops could go to Britain, although likely they would be there just for training exercises. Although I suppose they could be, if there's a NATO war, they could also be deployed into NATO. Uh, Sunak's office said that the agreement will put will, will be put before Japan, the, to, the two countries' parliaments in the coming weeks. Now, in promo, in hyping this and promoting this agreement, uh, the British Prime Minister uh, Sunak actually, in his in a statement that he issued prior to his meeting with Kishida, said that the UK will be the first European country to have a reciprocal access agreement with Japan most important defense treaty between the UK and Japan since 1902. Now, what happened in 1902? 1902 was the year of the first Anglo-Japanese treaty alliance, and uh, which began an imperial relationship between a relationship between two empires, because that's what they were. Uh, and the British Empire is still the British Empire, although the Japanese may not consider themselves an empire. Was actually coming back is the kind of militarism that flowed from that 1902 agreement. Now, what the 1902 treaty actually helped to set up was first it set up the Russo-Japanese War. It helped to set the conditions for the Russo-Japanese War because uh, when the uh, when the Tsar, Nicholas II, sent the, the Russian Baltic fleet, Russian Atlantic fleet to uh, the uh, Western Pacific, uh, he had, the, the fleet had to sail around Africa and India to get to the Pacific Ocean, and the coaling stations all along were controlled by the British Empire, and they denied the coal to the Russian fleet so that by the time they got there, they were very tired and, and ex- basically exhausted and easily then defeated and destroyed by the Japanese Navy. But it also, what followed the 1902 treaty was then the 1904, the British uh, Entente with France in 1904, which then was added to the uh, – Russia was added to that in 1907. It became the Triple Entente. With the Triple Entente, you then had the possibility of a two-front war against Germany. That set the conditions for World War I. So the U.S. and Britain are now doing the same thing to China, trying uh, – ringing China with, a lot, with allies by which they then will believe, will, will believe that Ch- China will then be defeatable in war. So those allies, as I already said, include, uh, besides Japan, Australia, the Philippines, as General Bierman said. Uh, the, uh, they're trying to bring India into this. Of course, NATO is going to be part of it because NATO has already designated China to be a very dangerous rival. Uh, that happened last year at the summit in uh, Spain, in Madrid, in uh, June of last year. They made that declaration. So you're setting up the conditions, as General Bierman said, setting the theater for war against China, as, has, as, he, as according to his description, was already done against Russia. So that, and the war, this will likely, if this war happens, there's a very great danger that it'll go nuclear. And if that happens, well, there'll be nobody around to tell, as Helga has been making the point, there'll be nobody around to write that history. So there's a lot more I could say about all of this, where it came from, but I think in the interest of time, I will... Uh, uh, leave it off here for the moment and leave time, hopefully, for some questions. 